right. Good afternoon, Governor. Participants. Hello. Welcome to our participants and attendees. My name is Christy Bizanson, and I'm the director of Results Washington. Welcome to the public performance review with Governor Inslee. Uh, first, we are not able to offer ASL interpretation today, but closed captioning is still available. You can turn on closed captioning using the Zoom toolbar, move your mouse and the toolbar will appear, and to activate closed captioning, click the live transcript button, then select the show subtitle option. As I speak to you today, my home and my local footprint is on the ancestral lands of the Nisqually, Coast Salish, Cowlitz, and Squawks and Island peoples. The area of what is now Thurston County is the traditional homeland that was taken from tribes and bands as part of the Medicine Creek Treaty. I pay my respect to the elders of the past and those individuals here today, for colleagues, neighbors, family, friends, and community. I'm an honored guest on these lands. I invite you to pause and reflect on where your footprint is located today. If you're not sure, the Native Land app can be a starting point, and we will place the link in the chat should you want to learn more. Before we get started today, I want to briefly orient you to Zoom webinar. We know many of you are familiar with Zoom meetings, but there are some differences in Zoom webinar, which we're using today. The biggest difference is that you won't be able to talk or have your video visible. This ensures all participants can focus on today's presentation. First, notice the Zoom toolbar. Move your mouse and the toolbar will appear, and you can see icons for the chat and Q&A. We're using chat to share the links to the materials, but chat between participants and Q&A is not available. You can adjust your view to make the presentation or speaker larger by sliding the vertical bar on your screen from left to right. And we're not able to offer ASL interpretation today, but closed captioning is still available. You can turn on closed captioning using the Zoom toolbar, move your mouse and the toolbar will appear. To activate closed captioning, click live transcript and then select the show subtitle option. If you need technical assistance, please email results at gov.wa.gov and we will do our best to help you. And finally, at the end of the session, a survey will pop up. Please take the time to complete the survey. This will provide us with meaningful feedback about your meeting experience. And with that, I wanna share about the purpose of our meeting today and a little bit about how we got here. The public performance review process or PPR is our updated approach to public reviews. We will meet with the governor regularly to share details on a specific cross-agency project tied to his priorities. It will be an opportunity for the governor, governor to hear from those impacted by and involved in the project. And it serves as a space to talk about the work completed so far to help inform what is needed to get the project to completion. The Results Washington team serving in a facilitation, coordination and project management role has partnered with state agencies to tackle complex cross enterprise improvement projects. We currently have six projects underway and the road to today's PPR meeting began several months ago. Here's how we got here. We met with agency leaders to identify and finalize improvement project recommendations. Leaders then chose what they wanted to work on and at what level of responsibility, and they identified the appropriate subject matter experts. We worked with those subject matter experts to home in on a specific scope for the project. And it's important to note that the project selected had to be done within a certain set of criteria, including within existing resources, without policy or legislative action, and without IT being the only solution. This meant the project teams had to be very focused and selective in chartering the work, and the result are projects that are feasible, attainable, and sustainable. The purpose of this project that we are featuring today is to create agency standards for digital equity and digital inclusion. The project team will develop best practice guidelines about how to ensure state government websites and online forms are compatible with mobile devices by 2022. These practices will include accessibility, language access, digital literacy support, and human-centered design so all individuals can access the information they need with ease. This is a collaborative multi-agency project. A special thanks to our sponsoring agencies, Department of Commerce, Department of Social and Health Services, and the Employment Security Department. Today's presenters will cover this project in much, much more detail. But first, we look forward to hearing from, from our governor uh, as we get started. Governor, I turn it over to you. Thank you for being involved in this. I'm very excited about learning about this effort. And the reason is, is that we know we want to make equity a fundamental foundational value throughout our whole state government. 
and the ability to contact, communicate with our st state government in a truly equitable and accessible way is absolutely fundamental to that. If people can't talk to us, if they can't share information with us because of some limitation, we can't reach our equity goals. So this is very much a value-based issue, what we're talking about today of getting improvement of our digital access system is a is an equity issue first and foremost, perhaps, as well as efficiency and effectiveness, of course. So I look at this as uh, critical to our mission, and I'm glad we're talking about it from a multi-agency standpoint. So everybody's working on this project. Uh, thank you very much. I'm looking forward to really seeing, uh, hearing from people who are really affected by this. At this level. So uh, let's get going. I'm looking forward to ideas. Thanks a lot. All right. Thank you, Governor. Now we will hear from Kendrick Stewart, Deputy Director of the Department of Commerce. Good afternoon, and thank you, Governor Ensley, Results Washington team, and guests. Again, my name is Kendrick Stewart. I'm Deputy Director and Chief Operations Officer with your Department of Commerce, and my pronouns are he, his. Glad to be here to introduce this important project um, that's focused on ensuring all Washingtonians, regardless of where they live and regardless of their lived experience, have real equitable access to government services, including our social safety net through digital inclusion. Commerce, like Chrissy shared, is a sponsoring agency of this project along with the Department of Social and Health Services and the Department of Corrections, so I appreciate the partnership. Um, just a little bit more about Commerce, for those who don't know, agency with a, with a short name, um, but a big impact and a big portfolio. We administer just under 100 programs, name an issue, and we probably have a program that works in it whether that be housing, growth management, international trade, economic development, clean energy, child care, and broadband and digital equity. Over the past 18 months, the internet has become the safest and often only option to meet basic needs, while many of us stayed home to stay safe and uh, slow the spread of COVID-19. For families and individuals who did not have the skills or ability to effectively navigate government systems and services in the digital environment, this transition has been painful. It's exposed major inequities that have put many people's stability, health, and futures at risk. Those who access our government services expect and deserve usability. I just wanna repeat that. Those who access and need our government services expect and deserve usability. Our websites should be accessible to people with disabilities, English language learners, and people who, who lack digital skills. It should be easy for consumers to find the right program and enroll. Washington State agencies have work to do to reach these standards. Not every agency has quantitative data detailing racial and social disparities and program accessibility, but we know from anecdotal evidence that they exist. The Poverty Reduction Work Group identified technical barriers that people experiencing poverty have when trying to access programs to meet their basic needs. Likewise, agencies that engage in direct service delivery, um, like a DSHS, report that older individuals, those experiencing poverty and people of color, are more likely to experience technical barriers to service delivery. This project enhances the agency's commitment to creating an economic recovery that lifts all Washingtonians by integrating the social safety net with economic recovery. A focus on digital equity and inclusion is one part of ensuring an, an inclusive and equitable recovery in Washington State. Through this project, we will work to ensure that Washingtonians have equitable access to information about Washington State government services by developing agency standards for digital equity and digital inclusion. We know work is being done in other areas to focus on access to affordable high-speed internet and the associated devices. The scope of this specific project, however, is to focus on developing best practices guidelines by 2022 for state government websites and online forms to be compatible with mobile devices. Moving forward, we know two things are true. More people will get their information online and our state is becoming more diverse. Digital equity is how we ensure that all Washingtonians, regardless of where they live or what their lived experiences are, are able to participate in these increasingly vital digital spaces. We have a responsibility to identify and break down the barriers preventing people from easily accessing the information they need. Commerce, along with other co-sponsoring agencies, the SHS and the Department of Corrections, welcomes this opportunity to lay out a roadmap and best practices that allow every agency to do its part. Thank you, and in the spirit of the Summer Olympics, 
I will hand the baton over to Emily Grossman, who's lead policy advisor in the Community Service and Housing Division here at the Department of Commerce, who will share more information about the need for this project and how it connects with other work across state government. Thank you. Thank you, Kendrick. Um, my, good afternoon. My name is Emily Grossman. I work at the Department of Commerce as a policy advisor. My pronouns are she, her. Um, as you have heard in this project, we want to address the digital divide. And I'm going to talk a little bit more specifically about our goals and about how the Department of Commerce is positioned to engage. The digital divide to us means closing or at least reducing the gulf between individuals who have ready access to state programs in a digital environment and those who don't. When we're talking about the digital divide, you often hear the solution referred to as a three-legged stool, with the three legs being ac internet access, access to internet-ready devices, and digital literacy skills. Um, we have adopted the National Digital Inclusion Alliance's solution, which actually has five legs. It's a five-legged stool. And you can see here on the slide what those five legs are. We're focused on the last three that you can see highlighted in blue. We want to get state agencies closer to programs and online content that are designed with the needs of people with do low digital skills in mind. Um, and preferably, they'll be designed with the participation and consultation of people who have lived experience of encountering barriers when accessing state resources online. We want our con online content and services to be navig navigable by all users, including English language learners, people with disabilities, and people with low digital literacy skills. And we plan to do this by implementing best practices such as plain talk, translated materials, and quality technical support statewide. The Department of Commerce is ready to maximize this opportunity. Right now, we have a statewide broadband office. As you know, they're working to implement a statewide digital navigation program, and they're also developing a framework for communities to assess and address barriers to digital inclusion locally. And we're adding three staff who are focused solely on digital equity and inclusion to the statewide broadband office. That will provide an essential opportunity for this project. The new digital equity staff will work alongside this group to help connect stakeholders statewide to the project and assist with implementation. And that's it for me. I'm happy to answer any questions before we move on. And thanks for the chance to speak. Thank you. Okay, I will hand this over to uh, Babs Roberts at the Department of Social and Health Services. Babs? Thank you, Christy, uh, and good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, everyone. My name is Babs Roberts. I have the pleasure of serving as the director of the Community Services Division at the Department of Social and Health Services. Um, we thought to take a moment this morning in this presentation and demonstrate exactly why expanding state agencies' ability to implement the digital equity is so important. In the Community Services Division, we receive between five and 10,000 basic food applications every week. The data that you see depicted here shows a, the corresponding weeks um, in 2019, 2020, and 2021, and clearly shows that the application rate for this program increased significantly during the first weeks of the pandemic before settling back to a similar and pre-COVID pattern. Over the, over the course of the recent public health emergency, GSD also uh, received more than 157,000 applications for the Disaster Cash Consolidated Emergency Assistance Program. Applications for benefits can be submitted online through our Washington Connections uh, portal by paper applications being dropped off in person or at our offices, or, or people can apply by phone. Prior to the public health emergencies, emergency clients could use phones or kiosks in our lobbies in our lobbies to submit those applications. Access was much more difficult for low-income populations during COVID due to limited access to broadband, internet, Wi-Fi, or phone. But access was not the only issue that we are dealing with. For some, literacy in terms of digital access is also a factor, making it even more difficult to get those services online when your primary language is not English or if you have a visual hearing or other disability. 
89% of the public assistance caseload we have lists English as their primary language. The remaining 11% have a primary language other than English, with Spanish, Vietnamese, Russian, Chinese, and Korean being the next highest used languages. Additionally, some portion of that 11% are hearing or vision impaired, making access to phone or online services difficult. If we dive a little deeper into that data, um, of the more than 927,000 people receiving services from CSD, many have barriers that make access to our services online or in the other virtual um, options very difficult. And those include the homeless population. Currently, 10.3% of our, our clients report being homeless and their unstable housing situations make predictable access to phone or online options even more difficult. New Americans may also have a difficult time accessing us virtually. Currently, 6.7% of our population report an immigration status. 2% of that it reports being a refugee or have a asylee status. And fully 29.7% report some level of disability, including an aged population, uh, physical health barriers, or mental health barriers. The work of this project team will help state agencies define best practices and identify opportunities and implement changes that could reduce or eliminate those barriers. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Emily and Babs. Uh, Governor, do you have questions for uh, Emily or Babs? Uh, no, I'm good, thank you. It's a very clear presentation, thank you. Okay, thank you. Next, we will hear from Lisa Yanagita, Acting Chief of Staff at the Department of Social and Health Services. Lisa? Good afternoon, Governor, colleagues, and attendees watching virtually. My name is Lisa Yanagita, and I'm the Acting Chief of Staff for the Department of Social and Health Services. Thank you, Governor, for the opportunity to be here today to talk about digital equity in Washington State and why it is so important and essential to our customers and our shared goal of economic recovery. I wanna thank our partners in this work, including the Departments of Commerce, Corrections, Employment Security, OFM, and many of our other state agencies and partners. We're very happy to collaborate with Results Washington on this project. Even before the pandemic, the digital, di digital divide has long been a concern for people with low incomes. Digital inclusion is a priority for Washington State and for the Department of Social Health Services, and making high-speed broadband internet universally available is a key recommendation in the statewide poverty reduction work group's 10-year plan to dismantle poverty. At our department, we have been concentrating our efforts to ensure we're looking at all we do through a lens of equity, diversity, and inclusion. This project enhances our agency's commitment to creating an economic recovery that lifts all Washingtonians by, again, integrating the social safety net with economic recovery. The department will help ensure the success of the project by including the people most impacted in its planning and implementation. You hear more about how we're gonna do this from Babs Roberts, um, director of our community service division. For many clients that we serve, English is not their first language. As an example, 87 languages are listed as primary languages of Washingtonians receiving food, case, and medical assistance support from the department. We have done work on our website to make vital information translated and accessible through dedicated language pages. And here to highlight in further detail the work already done by our agency related to online accessibility is Carolyn Cole, our Office of Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion's Chief of Access and Inclusion Planning. Again, thank you for the opportunity to speak on these efforts. You know, Carolyn, before you start, it looks like we need to just sync up the slides there. There we go. Thank you. Go ahead. All right. Good afternoon, Governor Inslee and meeting participants. My name is Carolyn Cole. Uh, pronouns she, her. I am the Chief of Access and Inclusion Planning in the DSHS Office of Equity, Diversity and Inclusion. Um, and I was invited today to really talk about my office's work in helping support universal access and inclusion as a department-wide program. Um, so digital equity is one aspect of a greater universal access and inclusion program that we are building at DSHS. Uh, next, oh, yep, we're on that slide. Uh, so the next slide shows really kind of the principles that are the foundations of the DSHS uh, institutional commitment to access and inclusion. 
Um, and any access and inclusion program really needs to have institutional commitment by its leadership, which we do have. Um, and the five principles would be department-wide approach, accountability, organizational capacity, legal compliance, and meeting employee and customer needs, which often means actually going above and beyond the legal minimum requirements. Some highlights uh, that I wanted to touch upon before we go to the next slide as part of the larger access and inclusion program, we have ADA and language advisory committees. They are convened monthly. We have ADA coordinators and language access advisors across the entire department representing all administrations and the Division of Vocational Rehabilitation. We have an appointed OC, OCIO, Policy 188 coordinator. A, we have included access and inclusion in department-wide mission statements, strategic plans and success measures, administrative policies, COVID-19 emergency procedures. We have implemented the governor's COVID-19 language access plan. We have helped procure language interpreter services, not only for on the phone, but also uh, video remote. Uh, our uh, updates to our website, trainings, our DSHS language testing and certification program improvements, and our uh, LTC program expansion for testing of bilingual DSHS employees. Uh, next slide. So written for written translation services, I wanted to highlight that DSHS offers the document translator test for certified languages only, Chinese, simplified and traditional, Korean, Russian, Spanish, and Vietnamese. We have a communication assistance available translated top tagline document that will be circulated and implemented department-wide shortly. Uh, we utilize DES master contract for written translation services and have built an entire IT system around making those translation requests. We have off-contract purchasing where there are languages of lesser diffusion in the US where we cannot get translations on the DES master contract. Um, and we have extensive master language code usage uh, for digital equity for language. Uh, client letters, forms, and other documents use the master language codes. 87 plus language codes have been encountered by DSHS, and we have worked on the cleanup of the crosswalk for multiple IT systems that require master language codes to get those correct translations out to clients. Next slide, please. For spoken language interpreting services, we provide in-person, over the phone, and video remote spoken language interpreting services. They can be pre-scheduled as well as on demand, right, available for the client within 30 seconds or less. We have multiple contracts to be able to fulfill this need, um, and they are utilized daily to meet the demand. Um, and DSHS does offer the medical interpreter and social service interpreter tests for certified and screen languages. Uh, certified languages being Chinese Cantonese, Chinese Mandarin, Korean, Russian, Spanish, and Vietnamese. And screen languages are all non-certified languages. Uh, basically, speakers of these languages receive authorization rather than a certification, but the credentials are functionally the same. Uh, everyone statewide very much depends on these uh, certifications to make sure that we have actually qualified interpreters and translators providing these services. Next slide, please. And lastly, I wanted to highlight, because we are talking about digital equity, at least on our side for my office, what we've done to help update the DSHS website. Uh, we do now have top 17 encountered language pages, which are accessible via our website footer. Uh, those are English, Spanish, Russian, Chinese simplified, and traditional, Korean, Arabic, Khmer, Punjabi, Somali, Ukrainian, Vietnamese, Amharic, Farsi, Tagalog, Lao, Tigrinya, and we have added American Sign Language. We have a translated non-discrimination policy, translated COVID-19 vital information documents. We created an ASL video for our COVID-19 vital information. We have a DSHS publications library of all of our translations. Um, and we do have an ADA OCIO policy 188 accessibility statement. If there are barriers encountered, uh, we invite folks to email us, contact us so that we can help remove those barriers. The last slide is simply just my contact information if there are any further questions or comments. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to share what my office has done. Thank you, Lisa. Carolyn, Governor, do you have any questions? Yeah, uh, Carolyn, uh... 
what, you know, from, I appreciate this extensive review, from your observation, what's the greatest need going forward? Uh, the greatest need going forward is to do, uh, Governor, a very thorough self-evaluation of what would actually be covered if we're just talking about digital equity. What is actually covered, considered covered technology? Um, a lot of times folks actually just assume it's just making your websites compatible. I'm glad other folks have also identified that making your forms, uh, client letters, um, other employee generated documents that we have at a high volume every day, even Outlook emails, actually fall under OCIO policy 188 covered technology and would need to be addressed strategically about how we will bring them into compliance. So I believe always the first step and best practice is to do a thorough self-evaluation to identify all the covered technology within Washington state government. Got it. So what does that mean? So I write uh, one DSHS staffer sends a memo to another, it's in English. I don't think you're probably calling for that to be immediately uh, interpreted in 98 other languages. I mean, what is what should that look like? Uh, so, right, we will have, uh, for example, there's a differences and probably different standards that we would need to have if it's an internal communication that's really between employees versus vital communications that really need to be sent out to clients and the public who are trying to access our services. If it is vital, considered vital information, we are required to provide meaningful access to them under Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. We can do this first by at least translating those uh, communications that are vital uh, into a minimum top encountered number of languages. And of course, by request, always translating them into other languages that are needed. It's very important to always include taglines for folks to be able to contact the correct person to make requests if they see their supported uh, minimum number of languages isn't represented in the initial batch of translations. So I guess the question is, you know, maybe this is too far afield, but what internal documents that normally would not be viewed by the public, mm -hmm. you know, should be subject to an interpreted service? I would assume it would be ones where there was a request. There's a public records request for this memo to answer it, we send it to the public with an interpretive service. Is Does that work? Does that suffice? Is that what we're thinking here? Uh, so, Governor, actually, it would be what we do in more of the social and health services setting already being done, primarily because of Section 1557 of the Affordable Care Act. Uh, we include translated taglines that show folks who to contact. We send that along with the English uh, document. They are to use the translated tagline to then contact uh, those usually primarily over the phone to get an interpreter over the phone who may be able to explain um, the document that was sent, or they can use that time to actually just request a full translation in the language that's needed. But typically it is sending a tagline, a, a lot, a lot of taglines, as many as you can do uh, in different languages that quickly just shows what the contact information is if folks do need a full translation or would like uh, on the over the phone interpreter to walk them through that document. So that's going on today, right? It is. It's very much so, probably more heavily in, again, the health and social services sector because we do have that precedent with Section 1557. But I really truly believe it needs to be applied across all sectors. Um, it is something that works. Uh, when folks immediately see the English document, but also the taglines translated, they can immediately go to the translated taglines and get in touch uh, with someone who can further explain the document or get a full translation for them. Thank you. Thank you, Governor, for those questions. Okay, well, thank you, Lisa and Carolyn. Uh, we are now going to hear from Katie Lewis, Family Resource Center Employment Case Manager at Neighborhood House. Katie, I'll turn it over to you. Hello, yes, so my name is Katie Lewis. My pronouns are she, her, and they, them. And I am the Family Resource Center Employment Case Manager at Neighborhood House. That's a lovely, very long job title. Um, and I work, uh, well, currently remotely, but in High Point, uh, in the High Point community of Seattle, Washington. 
Um, and first of all, I just want to say thank you so much for inviting me to represent um, the needs of English language learning clients and immigrants and uh, individuals who really need accessibility. Uh, I'm optimistic that we can improve the user experience for customers who are struggling with accessibility right now. Uh, and I can share a little bit about my organization, Neighborhood House. Um, so Neighborhood House uh, builds community and increases access to housing, health, education, and economic opportunity. Uh, our vision is for a healthy, diverse, and welcoming community free of poverty and racism where all people thrive. Um, my goal it would be to work myself out of a job. That is the goal. Um, and our work in King County, we work with 15,000 community members annually. We focus on low income communities, public housing residents, um, immigrants and refugees, and 90% of our clients are BIPOC. Um, Neighborhood House was founded in 1905. I actually just looked this up and it is only 17 years younger than the state of Washington. Um, we offer a full range of services from prenatal services to uh, aging and disability. Uh, I focus on adult education and employment. Uh, Neighborhood House has um, offered increased support during the pandemic. Um, so we have connected individuals to vaccines. We have um, provided translation for unemployment benefits, and we have ad advocated for increased access to those benefits. Uh, Ready to Work is uh, the program I work with most. It is a partnership between the City of Seattle, Homesite, Asian Counseling and Referral Services, Neighborhood House, and Literacy Source. Uh, I work with clients who take an intensive English class uh, on a quarterly basis. It is 12 hours per week and it's currently happening over Zoom. And this is an example of what, oh, on the last slide there, uh, is an example of what our outreach flyer looks like. So we offer it in eight languages. The first one is in English and the lower one is in Amharic. You can go to the next slide now. Uh, our ready to work students are adults. So they must live in Seattle, be above 18 years or older to participate, and they have to have an interest in learning English and then also getting a job or enrolling in higher education. Our clients speak Amharic, Oromo, Tigrinya, Somali, Vietnamese, Spanish, Cantonese, Cambodian, and several other languages. And most of our clients are parents with school age children. So while they are on Zoom learning from home, so are their children. So it can be um, a loud environment. It can be an environment that requires a lot of computers and a lot of tech. Uh, so this above picture is an example of what our class looks like pre pandemic. And we all miss it very much being in this format. Uh, now class is held uh, on Zoom. And I also have one-on-one -on -one meetings with my clients uh, every week during the quarter over Zoom. Uh, so for broadband and technology, uh, these are some basic statistics of um, what our students are looking at. 70% um, of current students do not own their own computer. Uh, they are loaned one for the duration of the Ready to Work English program. Uh, but they are expected to return that when they are finished with the class. 90% of students need hotspots or other supports to fully participate in class. They, they typically need headphones, ethernet cables, uh, Wi-Fi hotspots on loan from the library, just many services to strengthen the connection that they have in their own home. Uh, and then 100% of students have made digital literacy gains in 2020. So we're really happy to report that although our students do struggle with basic um, technology accessibility, they have made improvements of all kinds over this year. Our clients access all kinds of social safety net services and state websites uh, that many access food stamps, TAMP, cash assistance, 
unemployment insurance. Uh, many are becoming or in the process of becoming child care providers in their own homes. So they interact quite often with the merit system. Uh, there's also students enrolling in college for the first time and accessing WASFA. And then there's also paid family and medical leave, disability services, and I'm sure even more that are not on this slide. So many client requests begin over the phone most often. Clients don't know where to look for um, state website accessibility. They don't know if it begins in their email with a Google search uh, or with some other website that they don't know of. And so most often because they form trusting relationships with case managers like me and others um, at nonprofit organizations, it starts with a phone call that's like, I don't remember my password or the food stamps office didn't tell me that I sent the wrong documents and now I have to reapply. I can't find the website. They sent me a link, but I still don't understand. Or even I lost my benefits and I don't know why. Yeah. Um, and with digital literacy, a cli our clients need a high level of coaching to utilize technology, websites, and digital tools. Um, students struggle with digital literacy skills that we really take for granted. So this includes password keeping, uh, whether like a physical written copy or saved online, uh, detecting fraud attempts. It's something that makes students fearful or nervous to interact with websites because they don't know if it's authentic. Um, digital vocabulary is lacking and so is um, a basic intuition about website interactivity. So there's a lot of uh, hidden skills that we don't realize we have learned along the years of using these services like embedded links, um, self-guided applications, drop-down menus, um, suggested formatting when typing answers. Uh, there's many of these skills that we just don't even think about that we know. Another example is that um, a, a skill that I teach my students very often it, during our tech check or tech, tech tips is power cycling. So I'm sure many of us in this Zoom meeting know what a power cycle is. It's just when you're experiencing technical difficulties on any number of devices like a phone or a computer and you just simply turn it off and turn it on again with the hopes of rebooting some kind of problem. This is a skill that I teach students because um, they still may not know that that's something that can help. Um, this slide was taken from a recent workshop that I created uh, on the recently reinstated unemployment insurance job search requirements. So those went back into effect earlier this month in July and many students were not aware that they were now required to be searching for jobs and you know, doing job search activities. Uh, and I created this slide um, based on the Employment Security Department website with the far right column being examples of documentation, um, how to document job search activities. And if you'll look at what I circled in red, it says screenshot, 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 and my clients, they don't know what a screenshot is. And so on the left, I explained what a screenshot is and how to do it. So just Google searching, like whatever their device name is combined with how to screenshot. Um, this is just some basic instruction that I do um, to help clients get closer to meeting their requirements to continue receiving unemployment. And this is an example of the ready to work website. So it is incredibly basic, as you can see, um, both the words, for example, zoom, check in, typing, they are all clickable and so are the pictures. Um, and this is the only thing that you see when you come to the ready to work home screen for students to join class or do their homework. Uh, and I know that state websites may not be able to look like this at all times, especially with the Comic Sans font, uh, but this is something that we're hoping um, 
governmental websites can emulate just in their simplicity, in their um, just paring down of things that, that students have to interact with when they go to the websites. And this is a list of recommendations for digital inclusion, um, things that I have learned over my time as a case manager has really helped students to interact with websites. Um, so this includes comprehensive customer service, really walking customers all the way through an application process instead of sending them a link or sending one email and not, not following up. Um, screen sharing on Teams or Zoom or another video platform is very helpful to um, not be in the same place with a client if, if we have to be working from home, but being able to share documents and go through something at the same time together. Uh, websites with pictures as links are very helpful as seen in that last ready to work website slide. Uh, also highly visible translation tools. Um, for example, I know that on the Employment Security Department website, there are translation tools, uh, but they are in a gray on gray bar at the very bottom of the landing page. So we're hoping that that's something that will become hopefully bigger font, maybe at the top, more accessible. Um, also websites without walls of text that can be just very intimidating to read for clients. Uh, and also how-to videos in first languages. Yes. Okay, thank you, Katie. Governor, do you have questions for Katie? Uh, yes, Katie, thank you. So one of the things you described is a need for intensive assistance to people like one-on-one, -on -one, which I can really understand. Mm -hmm. How do we clone you? I mean, you've got hundreds of thousands of people need this service. I know not everybody's getting it. The incredible talents you're bringing that, you know, how do we extend that? You just need a lot more people in your position. That is a good question. And I appreciate that. It's very kind. Um, I think that the how-to videos are a great way to, um, to kind of like package up what I do with clients one-on-one. -on -one and just leave it there all the time on the website. So um, there is the benefit when I'm working one-on-one -on -one with clients of getting to answer their questions and show them exactly where I'm pointing on the website. But um, I would say a how-to video, especially in um, many languages is the next best thing where you can show someone exactly what it looks like to create a, for example, a job search requirement log. So if you have to do your three activities of job searching for the week, what does it look like to um, to do one of those or to log that on the um, example log on the Employment Security Department website? Got it. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. This is something we should pursue. Thank you, Katie. Uh, up next is Matt LaPalm, Product Manager for Customer Experience from the Employment Security Department. Matt? Hello, Governor Ensley, and to this inspiring group, and to uh, uh, well, everyone who's uh, who's leading the way here. My name is Matt LaPalm. I use he, him pronouns, and I have the privilege of leading uh, the customer experience team here at the Employment Security Department. Uh, I'm here to talk about the work my team is doing and supporting, but I do want to start by sharing a little bit about why uh, this is so important to us. Uh, our values do guide our work, and what you're seeing on the screen here is called our values lens. Uh, it organizes our six agency values and how we put them into action. Our work around uh, digital equity really connects to every single one of these values, and I know these are common amongst uh, many of us. Uh, today. Uh, in our agency 2021 and 2022 strategic plan, um, we have a focused singular goal of a diverse, equitable, and inclusive culture. And our strategic plan prioritizes employee engagement, organizational excellence, and customer satisfaction to address digital equity and other barriers. And our team, the customer experience team, is among many others who are working to execute this plan. So the, our team was formed during the pandemic and is tasked with reimagining how we include uh, our customers in our work by amplifying their voice in the product development process. 
So our team works directly with development teams to make sure we're accounting for all customers when we're building and maintaining our digital products. Our team is comprised of user experience researchers, user experience designers, a coordinator focused on access for our customers with limited English proficiency and accessibility barriers, and our agency's Spanish translator. We listen to our customers and stakeholders, like Katie, and design experiences based on what we hear. We validate those experiences directly with our customers to make sure our products meet their needs. And by combining these disciplines, we've built a team that can look at our agency from the outside in. And in many ways, we're still a very new team, but our capacity is growing. Focusing on equity, I'd like to talk a little bit about what our agency is doing and has done to address some digital equity uh, during unprecedented demand for unemployment insurance. We learned that the questions we ask, I'm oh, sorry, I'll go back to the, that slide. Um, I can continue, but we, we learned that, uh, to Katie's point, the, the questions we ask uh, unemployment claimants are often uh, too complex for many customers to answer on their own. And that complexity leads to challenges for claimants when they need to contact the department before they feel confident enough to apply or respond. <laughs> and to help, we we're providing guidance to these questions on uh, in 18 languages on our website. And we're doing user experience research now to guide changes to those questions and hopefully make guidance unnecessary in the future. Uh, and that would include things like uh, the, the videos that Katie was uh, discussing. We've also addressed uh, the increased, or well, we've also increased the time a, a claimant has to respond to our questions from five to 10 days. Um, which was a difficult thing internally, but it helped us uh, sort of give people the time they need to do some of the research and some of the follow-up work that they need to do in order to respond. And this work will create more confident users, but lower barriers to support and create more equitable outcomes for our customers and, uh, and allow them to be sort of more self-sufficient if that's what they choose to do. Uh, language access is also a really critical equitable digital outcome, and I'm glad to hear many of us talking about it. Uh, to address this, we've added uh, additional language access uh, to esd.wadic.gov, again, like Katie mentioned, um, and we've expanded the number of language support pages to 16. So that's many more than we had before the pandemic began. We've expanded the content on those landing pages to help unemployment claimants with limited English proficiency find their way through the system including the, the job search information that uh, Katie was referring to earlier. And we have evidence that these are really working to help people navigate. People navigate. Uh, in addition to reducing the complexity and improving language access, we're also working on other things like improving the navigation, both in English and Spanish. It's one of the things we find is that customers with limited digital literacy have a, a trouble navigating a complex menu. So we're working on that, making also making the language landing pages I spoke about earlier easier to find. Uh, so it's, we're, already, we're already on the move there. And then building new virtual assistant, I think this is interesting, building a new virtual assistant that will help claimants with low digital access get the same kinds of answers to frequently asked questions available on our website, but through the telephone. And also adding a unique phone number for those customers with limited English proficiency to get support in their language rather than calling our general claim center phone number. So these initiatives will help build new pathways for our customers and, and hopefully guarantee their success and expand access and lower barriers. We've plenty of work to do and many additional projects underway that will definitely impact digital equity. I'm grateful uh, today to listen and learn from this amazing community um, and to hear the feedback and lived experiences of our community partners and citizens. And I'm hopeful uh, that this work and others uh, related to Results Washington initiatives will really help teams like ours learn from the success of all these other agencies and reach our collective standards for digital equity inclusion and amplify the common needs of our customers and address these barriers at a system level. And I'm grateful for everyone's leadership here. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Matt. Uh, Governor, do you have any questions for Matt before we pass it over to Babs? Yeah, Matt, when did you start this kind of work with your group? Yeah, great question, Governor. We were, we were formed in the agency and we came together as a team uh, in the late fall, or, or I'm sorry, early fall, so September of last year. 
Um, and we've been sort of running ever since. Well, you know, this is really challenging. You're the right uh, agency to talk about these things because you have one of the most difficult challenges. The complexity of the employment, employment security system is beyond human imagination. And it's really challenging work to both comport with federal law and have something that the consumer can understand. It, it, I mean, I've looked at this and, you know, the complexity of this system is just not designed for, for homo sapiens. So you got a real challenge on your hands. Um, to what extent to, is your internal to other people in the agency? Like, do you get, do you get a view of every posted document to see if you can improve on it, on its usability in the system? Tell me what kind of input you have throughout the agency. Yeah, and documents are an interesting case. They're, they're something that many uh, work streams are uh, connecting with to improve. So communications and customer experience and our policy team all work on those documents. But yeah, to answer your question, we, we definitely see those and do our best to identify sort of what needs to be brought to the table in order to uh, improve access. Um, again, we're relatively new and many of our documents uh, have were created well before the pandemic. So we're in a bit of a catch up scenario. Um, and to your point, I think one of the things that is an interesting question is how policy concerns uh, sort of have knock on uh, impacts to equity uh, in unexpected ways when they make things more complex, when they make decisions more complex. Any complexity adds to inequity. It, it just does because the more complexity, the more challenging because of language and disability to navigate. You're just putting up more, you know, U-turns and, and dead ends. And so, and so this system is rife with that difficulty. Uh, talk to me about the best way to kind of train or, you know, your personnel. So what works best on training an ESC person on how to develop a communication that is as understandable as possible? How does it, what works? Well, we have an excellent communications team and they, they use plain talk uh, guidelines to help us sort of focus in on the language part of this. But I think that this is a, a something, the standards that this group is working on would be very important to help us. Um, we are doing our best to sort of build these things internally, sort of build the, the plane while we're flying it. But every agency faces these barriers. These are not unique to employment security. So having a community of practice where we are uh, better understanding how we can be uh, multipliers uh, across the state is I think the thing we need the most uh, coming out of this group. Great, hope that you can satisfy, we can satisfy that. Great, all right, thank you, Matt. Looks like we have Babs up next. <clears throat> Yes, thank you all. And um, uh, I think uh, hopefully, as you can see, um, there's this project has some great potential, Governor. Um, the collaborative partnership across these agencies that you've heard from today and others that we'll um, be working with over the course of this project, um, as well as researching national best practices around this, will help us to develop a best practice guidance document that state agencies can use. Um, and, and such a document can be really that place, as, as Matt just talked about, where we can start to talk about best practices or we can begin to develop those sort of communities that practice and talk to each other. Um, the project plan includes, uh, will be completed within the next week or so, and we hope to have the guidance document itself drafted, leveraging what good work has already been done in some agencies or others. Um, it's an aggressive timeline, but there is there is work we can build off of rather than starting from scratch. Once that draft guidance is developed, we'll spend the next six months really gathering feedback through consultation with communities, um, uh, organizations like Katie's organization and others at the community level, stakeholder communities, and most in particular, people with lived experience who can most inform this work with us. 
Um, this is an important step to ensure that there's a broad lens on the development of the document and to ensure that we're hearing the voices of the people and the communities that we serve. And then finally, we'll elevate that feedback and any other information to finalize the document, potentially identify um, things that could be accomplished without additional resources, and then highlight what might need more resources into the future. I thank you so much for the opportunity to present this to you and, and to be a part of this organization and this group. All right, thank you, Babs. Governor, do you have any questions for Babs? Well, how are we doing on the timeline so far? We are on track, Governor. I'm, I'm very excited. We know that um, the project plan is due to be finalized next week. Um, the real big hurdle, the next big hurdle is the actual drafting of the document. We've given ourselves a fairly compressed timeline. Um, I think that's okay uh, for that compressed timeline because what we really want to focus in on and give a lot of time to is that stakeholdering and that work with communities and with uh, people with lived experience to inform uh, the final document. So I think we're uh, um, right on track. Great. Okay. Well, thank you, Babs. Um, and thank you to all who attended today. As a reminder, please take the time to complete the survey that will pop up at the end of this meeting. Um, thank you to our agency partners who helped us bring this project forward. It's an incredibly important project focused on connecting people to the social safety net through digital inclusion. We are so appreciative of the partnership with Department of Commerce, Department of Social and Health Services, and the Employment Security Department. So thank you to Kendrick, Emily, Lisa, Babs, Carolyn, Katie, and Matt for being a part of this work. Thank you to Results Washington Project Leads, Christine Stolle and Sharice Pitcock, and to all the Results team members for their parts in making this work possible. Um, and just a thanks to my leadership, Kelly Wicker, Jamila Thomas, and to you, Governor Inslee, for your support of me and the Results team and the shared work with our agency partners. And with that, I will turn this back to you, Governor. Right. Well, thank you. I got some insights today from this discussion. I appreciate it. Uh, I think you, you, we need, you need to think of yourselves as Olympic trainers, right? So the Olympics are going on right now. And there were two things that made them competitors. One, ambition. And we've got a high level of ambition to be as good as humanly possible to give people access to our services. And the other is persistence. I think something like this that involves kind of creating a culture across multiple agencies involves persistence. So in your work, I, I hope you'll think about how we embed a persistent approach to this throughout the years. This is not a one and done deal on how we create these techniques. So I hope you'll think about how to embed that, whatever we suggest. And with that, uh, let's go forward and do good work. So thank you. Bye. Thank you.